Hi everyone, my name is Ali Davis, founder of MediatorAcademy.com, home of the passionate mediator. This is the place where mediators, aspiring new and accomplished, come and learn from experienced mediators, practitioners and thought leaders from around the world. The mediators we interview are incredibly generous with their time. They share their knowledge, their wisdom with you so that you can learn, grow and improve your effectiveness and hopefully be inspired Go out into the big world, build your own success, success story, make a difference, leave a legacy, and maybe then come back onto Mediator Academy and share your story with my audience. In this interview, I'm going to be curious about the interplay between psychology and conflict resolution. I want to understand more about conflict stories and the kinds of interventions we can make to help transform conflict stories. I'll also be exploring the use of language and how it polarizes parties and how we mediators can intervene in ways that bring parties together. And I hope lots more. Now my guest today needs no introduction, but he's gonna get one anyway. He's mediated conflicts and taught dispute resolution in over 20 countries and is an internationally recognized speaker and published author of many journal articles and several outstanding books. His latest book, The Dance of Opposites, has just been released. And no doubt we'll be talking about this. Uh, he is currently an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University School of Law, Harvard University School of Law, and Amsterdam University's Institute on Dispute Resolution. He is the key founder and leader of Mediators Beyond Borders, an organization dedicated to building local skills for peace and promoting mediation worldwide. As director of the Center for Dispute Resolution, he served as a mediator, arbitrator, attorney, coach, consultant, facilitator, trainer, you name it, this guy's done it. And I feel incredibly privileged to welcome Ken Cloak onto Mediate Academy today. Ken, welcome. Thank you so much, Alan. Ken, Very nice. Oh, well, look, um, I, I said in a, mo a moment ago, it's a big day for me today. It's also a big day for Mediator Academy. When I started this thing a couple of years ago, I remember thinking, I wonder if one day I'll be able to invite and, and get Ken to, to come on to Mediator Academy, do an interview. And here you are. And I almost cocked the whole thing up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know, you, you you very generously rescheduled this interview after I messed the dates up. And you know what? I think that's the kind of guy you are. For me, you're the personification of generosity and compassion. You continue to give so much to the field of mediation. I just wanted to acknowledge that right at the outset. Okay. At the, Thank you. At the get-go. Now, um, I've read your books, your articles, and when, whenever I pick any of them up, and, you know, it's, it, I got, they're like my Bible. They're my key reference uh, materials when it comes to mediation. Mm. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll be looking for something. I'm searching for something. And before I know it, I've, I've consumed a chapter of your, of your work. And I've got to put the book down because I'm full. I'm just, I, you know, there's so many thoughts going around in my mind. I get distracted. I've been trying to under, wrestle with the, with the idea of why that is, you know. And I've come to the conclusion it's something to do with... Um, the ideas that you share, you know, which I find I find inspiring, I find them profound. But I, I all, it's also the language that you use to communicate those thoughts and ideas. Mm. And you know, it, it it's almost in every word, in every sentence, there is gold. And mm. um, and you know, you talk about language doesn't reflect the deeper meanings we attach and experience in conflict, and yet it's the medium that we all as mediators predominantly use to help others resolve conflicts, develop understanding and so on. What can we learn as mediators about language that can improve our effectiveness when we're helping others? Mm. Very nice. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be with you into this conversation. And thank you very much for the very kind words that you have used to describe the work that uh, I believe unites all of us. Um, 
I think I'd begin with two basic ideas. The first is uh, uh, the experience of conflict takes place at a level far below the level of language. And so every word is a kind of failure, uh, an imprecise struggle uh, to find some way of communicating what is actually taking place beneath the surface. And secondly, every word is a, a kind of expression of hope um, because it is an effort against all odds to bridge the gap that separates us as human beings. And so uh, every word that I write, I struggle for and I think about and I try to fashion in a way that allows it to get as close as I can get um, which is not uh, always uh, exactly right on, um, but as close as I can get to whatever it is that um, my uh, experience has led me to believe is true for people. Mm. So here is uh, the difficulty with language. Um, on the one hand, it is a little uh, arrow pointing directly at what you want the other person to understand, and on the other hand, it's an obfuscation. Um, it's a camouflage. It's a diversion. And the reason has to do with the psychology that you are describing. And that is, when we are talking about conflict, we are talking about two things simultaneously. One is the desire to be understood, and the other is the fear of loss. And so, in any conflict conversation, um, uh, there is some level of fear uh, associated with um, uh, the danger that this conversation could slip out of control, uh, the danger that it could actually move you into an arena in which the um, things that you have taken for granted all of a sudden began to disappear. Mm. The relationship that you love uh, all of a sudden now uh, no longer has to exist because you've asked questions about it that give it permission to go somewhere else. So um, here's uh, kind of where we begin, but there's a deeper level, and this is the part that it took me years to try to figure out at a simple enough level to be able to feel that I was onto something because it was so simple. And here's basically what it is. Every conflict conversation has three basic components. Component one, there is a pronoun. What is the pronoun? The pronoun is generally you, or they, mm -hmm. or he or she. If you use the word you in connection mm -hmm. with a problem, the form that it takes is an accusation. Right. What you're going to get when you make an accusation, automatically, inevitably, predictably, is a denial and a counter-accusation. Okay. So, uh, you are whatever your response will be, no, I'm not, and you're something else. <clears throat> so, um, there are three other uh, possibilities, at least. One is to use the pronoun it, okay. in which case we have described an object. Uh, the second is the pronoun I, in which case it's either a confession or a request. Mm -hmm. And third is the pronoun we. Second, there's a verb. The verb is you are or you did. If you say you are, uh, that's a judgment that is permanent yeah. um, and will always be resisted. And the third is the most um, complicated, and that is the accusation itself. So what is an accusation? If you break it down into its component parts, it consists of three things. First, there is a uh, indirect negative statement of interests. So, for example, if I say you are lazy, um, what are the uh, interests that I'm describing? 
well, I'm working very hard, you're not working very hard, and I would like some assistance. Mm. But I haven't put it that way because that's a positive and direct statement, and I am disguising it for a, a reason which I'll come to in a moment. Second, uh, there is an indirect negative uh, presentation of emotion. And that is, I'm presenting this uh, in a negative way, um, primarily because I would like you to understand what it feels like to be on the other side of this communication. And I could describe it to you, but that would take a while and it would require me to be introspective and it's not necessarily going to be effective. So instead what I'd like to do is to give you an authentic experience of what it feels like to be insulted, to be disrespected, by being disrespectful to you. And finally, um, the deepest part of this is that there is some deep relational fear. And generally what that boils down to is, you don't like me, you don't respect me, you don't love me. And the corollary, which is, I'm not worthy of your respect, and I'm unlovable. So now we can see that contained within any conflict statement are three things that each one of which can be reversed in several ways. Mm -hmm. So the pronoun can be shifted from you or he or she or they to it or I or we, and the verb can be shifted to something that was done. <clears throat> and uh, then you can reverse these three statements by um, making positive statements of interests, positive statements of emotion, that is what it is that you want, mm. what you like, what you prefer. Um, as opposed to what you don't like or hate. Mm. And finally, you can recognize that beneath all of this is some desire um, for a better relationship with the other person. Mm. So to me, this is uh, um, sort of uh, quite beautiful um, and filled with uh, potential for technique. Yes, yes. You know, I can, I can just... It's never been explained to me in that way before, but actually it's almost like a, 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 a being able to identify a particular pattern mm -hmm. and, and you know, um, <clears throat> it's almost formulaic. Yes, and, and well, that's, how I, that's how I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be mathematical, um, essentially. So I've actually, in the Dance of Opposites, uh, figured out uh, a couple of little symbolic ways of of showing it so that you could distill it down to a kind of mathematical formula genius genius so <laughs> you are so i'm mediating i have a party that's that that points at the other person and says you are lazy now i could reframe that so i could change the pronoun to uh you know i could i could pose a, a question um i i are you the verb frustrated because you don't feel supported Yes, perfect. You know, perfect free frame. And, uh, and yeah, but now beneath the surface of this, we discover that something uh, you've just been given a cue, um, uh, a little tiny hint about something that is taking place at a deep psychological level. Here's why: um, Is there a positive? Um, description that you could use for someone you're describing as lazy? Well, the answer is yes. Mm. They're relaxed, carefree, uh, without stress, all of those things. Mm. So you chose the negative word for a reason. Why? Well, now we can see that the word uh, that you have used as an insult is actually like a little trail of breadcrumbs reading back into your into your subconscious mind. So what is going on for you? Here's the translation of you are lazy. Um, I'm working really hard here and you aren't and uh, I would like to take time off but I don't give myself permission to do so. 
So when I see you taking time off, it actually presents me um, with my own failure as a human being to look out for myself. But instead of my owning that, I'm going to blame you for it. Mm. And so what you get is is uh, something very, very deep, which is um, desire to uh, not work so hard yourself or desire for the relationship with the other person, which has nothing to do with the work uh, or with being lazy. It has to do with the fact that you'd like to be doing it together. Mm. It would just be a lot more fun. Mm. So he, this is just a small example, and there are lots of possibilities that grow out of it, but we can imagine others yes. uh, that are very similar. So, so really, under, so, I mean, <clears throat> understanding how um, language is used in that way, um, and also appreciating that it, it goes a lot deeper. You know, one word like lazy has, you know, it's such a complex it, it's so complex what's what's kind of beneath mm. it yes uh, but but beneath um, here's the interesting piece um, uh, you said that you were interested in psychology and emotion mm. and um, there are a couple of relatively simple steps that explain why it's essential that all of us be interested in psychology yeah. and in emotion and um, we can get there very, very simply just by asking, um, what is a conflict? What are the indispensable elements that define a conflict? <clears throat> and if you think about this a little bit, you discover that there are a minimum of three. First, there have to be two or more people mm -hmm. or two or more sides of the same person. Yeah. Second, there has to be some disagreement or difference between them. Uh, but if you have two or more people, you don't have to have a conflict unless you have, and you won't have one unless you have a disagreement. And if you have two or more people who have a disagreement, you also will not have a conflict unless something else is present. And the something else that is always present that distinguishes conflicts from disagreements is the presence of uh, negative emotion. Therefore, every conflict has an emotional component. Yes. <clears throat> Therefore, as mediators, we have to pay attention to what is happening with emotion. We have to learn from psychology, essentially. When you say negative emotion, <clears throat> what, what, what would distinguish that, negative yeah. emotion? That it's a shorthand, actually, and it's very it's imprecise, and it's not a very useful term to tell the truth. Um, but what we it's uh, what we think of as negative emotions because they don't feel good. Okay, emotions that don't that's feel all. good. Yeah, no, yeah, that's... that don't. They, they, that's a simple way of describing it. Yes, um, they also don't feel good uh, either internally or externally. Yeah. Uh, nobody likes them. Uh, they're not pleasant. Mm. Um, they're actually uh, stress producing but the truth is that every emotion exists along a kind of um, uh, how would you describe it um, uh, a range so um, anger uh, is just one place um, that you can define along a line that extends from mild irritation to homicidal rage. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the precise place where this turns into something negative is very difficult to find. Mm. But here's the key to understanding anger, in my view. Um, very simply, it is, uh, nobody gets angry over things they don't care about. Therefore, Anger is always about caring. And what it actually is, is a way of communicating to someone that you care very deeply mm. about this. Mm. But it is complex because anger is also push away, meaning uh, give me some space. And anger is also hold on. 
So it's a way of actually holding on to another person. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of different ways of describing anger, and it's important to try to figure out what the person is really trying to achieve through their anger. Yes, go ahead. So, so if, if, we're, if we're with a party and they seem angry, you know, they're raising their voice, they um, red in the face, thumping the table, um, we, we might assume that they are, you know, they haven't quite reached, uh, you know, uh, homicidal rage just yet. They may be a few degrees uh -huh. off that. Um, although they could also just be irritated, you know, so, you know, how do we identify that and why is it important for us to identify that? Mm. Well, it's important for us to have a sense of approximately, uh, really, of, of how they move uh, from one thing to another. And uh, it is possible in the midst of their rage to ask a very simple question that will take them out of it, which is just, uh, why do you care so deeply about this? And when they're answering that question, they're actually shifting from the part of their brain in which their anger is being organized into the part of their brain that is actually um, trying to f uh, describe what it is that they really care about. Or very simply, you can say, it sounds like you care a lot about this. Can you tell me why? What a question. Yeah. It's a very powerful question, um, but the most important thing about anger is that for the most part, it's superficial. It's not the deepest emotion. Here's the, the example that I like to use uh, the most because it's the easiest to grasp, uh, is to assume that you have a small child and your child has gone out into the middle of the street and there are cars whizzing past. And so you run out into the street and you grab your child and you drag your child back to the sidewalk. And now you're about to say something to your child and you're going to speak in an angry tone of voice. But it turns out that there's a very um, rigorous, uh, almost mathematical logic to your doing that. And it's basically this. One, you just did something dangerous. Two, you were not hurt as a result of doing that dangerous thing. Therefore, three, you might do it again. So, four, I'm going to attach a little pain to what you just did by yelling at you, so that five, when you think of going in the street again, you'll remember the pain I caused you and stay on the sidewalk. But now, the reason why that's important is because there's another question you can ask, which is this. Immediately before you yelled at your child and used anger, what were you feeling? Love. Huh? Love? Worry? Uh, well, immediately before, you were feeling fear. Oh, con concern, fear, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because your child is in the middle of the street and you're frightened. And so, um, but you can't respond to your child out of fear in that moment because that's not going to keep your child out of the street. And that's your goal. But to recognize that beneath anger is fear. Yeah. How often? Often enough to entitle you to ask a question. What are you afraid will happen when someone is angry? Mm. And that will drop them into the place of fear. And if fear is actually beneath their anger, they will go there. But that isn't even the deepest place. Because what are you afraid of? And the answer is you're afraid that something terrible will happen to your child and how will you feel? The emotion that is underneath fear is the perception of the possibility of grief and loss and pain and guilt. Yeah. That's deeper than the, than the fear and the fear is deeper than the anger. And why would you feel grief and loss and pain and guilt if something happened to your child and now? we're at the place that you described yeah. because you love them. Yeah. So we've got four entirely different conversations that can take place. So now this is really beautiful because in every conflict situation, uh, 
there is something similar that takes place. Each one is a little bit different, so you can't automatically just plug in, you know, um, uh, anger, fear, pain, love. Yeah. But it is always the case, in my experience, that beneath anger is caring yeah. about something, about someone, and together with the caring, um, some difficulty in expressing it, either because trust has been broken, mm. uh, or because you don't, uh, the, the person has insulted you, and it will feel like you're um, uh, condoning the way that they're treating you. Yeah. Um, you're just being a doormat or something, uh, and you need to stick up for yourself or whatever it might happen to be. But the point is that the anger is instrumental. It's, an, it's designed to achieve a goal. And once we understand the goal, which we understand, which I try to understand at least from the inside out, that's the role of empathy, yeah. is for me to see the parent with the child yelling and saying, Why would, what would make me do that? Mm. and then really following it meticulously down to a place where I feel like, yes, this is it. And now we can see that actually what you're trying to get to through your expression of anger at the other person is a conversation about what you care about. Yeah. But it's the wrong way to get there. <laughs> yeah, I mean... the you know the intervention that you've just described there is i mean it's just a it's a beautiful intervention and you know I, I, so much thought has i i'm imagining so much thought has gone into this and i'm left feeling um a, a bit in <clears throat> i wouldn't say inadequate but i'm thinking oh my goodness you know what what else do, what else should i know um, in terms of intervening, in terms of understanding emotion, in terms of understanding the layers of em you know emotionality. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's a lifetime's work, really. And but the the here's the interesting part: um, if it's true, you recognize it, and once you recognize it, you can get there yourself without me or without my ideas even. So um, uh, really, I'm making this up, all of this up, because, oh, don't uh, say that. <laughs> <laughs> because basically it just feels right. Yeah. And all that I'm doing is just taking, just examining what it feels like and continuing to question what it feels like inside of me. But you know, I can, I can relate ex to exactly what you're saying. I can imagine my 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 son or my daughter stand. I can imagine responding in that way. And now I've got a really really good <laughs> good excuse now. <laughs> Listen, the reason I shouted was <laughs> yeah. Well, this is exactly right. So you here are the four conversations. Don't you dare do that again. That scared the heck out of me. If anything bad happened to you, I would feel awful. And I love you so much, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. Ultimately, what you need to do is to get to that last conversation. Mm. And um, the, the, you won't do it at the time, because if you want to get them out of the street, by all means, yell at them. Yeah. That's, but you do, you're not going to yell at them while they're in the street, because mm. that's going to freeze them. So, so I, 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 I sense we are segueing conveniently into kind of store the territory of stories yeah. here right yeah you know because you're talking about the, the the four different conversations and the conversation at the bottom where you're talking about you know i i love you very much are we try must is our our aim our purpose as mediators to try and take the conversation to that fourth story to that fourth level or, or a, a, to a deeper level uh, let me say it in a slightly different way. Uh, our con uh, the purpose of conflict resolution, I think, uh, is to give people a complete experience of their emotion. But the complete experience of anger, in this case, isn't anger. It actually has to go to these deeper levels mm. in order to be uh, just complete, done, over. 
And so the story is something that we create in order to um, repair the fabric of our perceived reality. It's a construct. And if you watch people create stories, it's especially useful to watch children create stories because they, they really create them carefully. Um, and everybody tells a story with the audience in mind. So uh, it's a little bit the, what, like the way they describe in school teaching to the test. Um, you are trying to enroll the listener uh, in your story. And what, therefore, is the form of the story? Well, we start with the fact that um, everybody in conflict feels uh, bad about what they have experienced and would like a little sympathy. And then we have to add in the fact that you don't get sympathy if you have power over your situation, if you're responsible for causing it. And therefore, every conflict story is one that is told about someone who has done something wrong to you and you are innocent and powerless in the face of this um, uh, ogre or dragon or evil person. Mm -hmm. So you can see that you've got three basic characters. We have a triangle. So at the apex of the triangle is the storyteller who is essentially a princess. Mm -hmm telling a story about a dragon to someone who they hope will be their knight in shining armor. And that's the basic form of the story. Mm. So... Does, that, uh, does we, that have a parallel with the drama triangle? Yes, okay. absolutely. It's the same thing. Right, okay. Exactly the same. And it's the victim, rescuer, perpetrator triangle. Mm -hmm. So we, you can see that the triangle is actually uh, very useful because it's very stable. Mm. But now it, we can make it more complex by creating a kind of uh, reverse upside down triangle on top of it, kind of like a, a Jewish star. Yes. Right? So at the top you have the princess and then the question is what separates the princess from the others? You know, sort of what is the line like this? Yeah. And the answer is um, uh, uh, really, in another question, what are the what are the uh, what does the princess stand for in the story? Right. And the answer is innocence, vulnerability, goodness, purity of heart. Right. Right. Well, um, is there anybody who isn't somehow a little bit innocent and a little vulnerable and? has you know some place in their heart that is pure mm -hmm. um, I think everybody has something like that mm -hmm. and then secondly um, what separates the rescuer um, determination courage in the face of adversity um, uh, uh, you know sort of heroic uh, mentality uh, and all of those are positive things that we can find in ourselves and in other people as well mm. And then the final and most difficult part of that reverse triangle uh, asks, what is it that the, the dragon has, or the wicked witch, or the ogre? And the answer is um, all of what we think of as the negative emotions, rage, mm. jealousy, hatred. Um, the, the, what, what separates the dragon is that we have decided that the dragon is responsible for the conflict, um, but truthfully, has, uh, has is there anybody who hasn't been a wicked witch at mm -hmm. some point in their life? Yeah. So we can all take responsibility, in other words, for what we have done in the conflict, and now we can see that there are out of this triangle three opposite lines of force heading to the center. So if you're the hero, that is the mediator. Um, the line of force is, I'm not going to rescue you. We're going to do this together. Okay. And the line from the princess is, uh, can be found with a question. Where princess, um, are you, com have you done anything, either by action or inaction, uh, that has made this conflict worse? 
And the line going to the dragon is, can't we extend empathy even for the one who has done something terrible, uh, something harmful? And that's redemption uh, and restorative justice come out of that last question. Right. So, so the idea of the story then is to um, take out the demonization, to take out the victimization, and to take out the externalization of, uh, of the rescuing part of it and see that it's all of us together. It's just us here. Um, we're all a little bit princess, uh, knight in shining armor, and dragon. But stories are actually way more complex than that. And in the, the new book, uh, The Dance of Opposites, I describe this a little bit. Um, starting with, there you go. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have a copy of Tan there? Because this is just... I do, one. yes. Hold, uh, just one second. Hold okay. on. Look at that library. Wow. Okay. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, Ken. Thank you. Well, um, all my babies look beautiful to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here's the example that's given in the book. Yeah. Um, the very first conflict story. Adam and Eve in the garden, and they have eaten the fruit of the tree. And uh, what happens? Uh, do you remember this? Uh, what happens next? No, go on. Okay, so the very first thing that happens is God speaks and says to Adam, did you eat of the tr uh, fruit of the tree? And of course, he's supposed to be on mission, so, uh, but he asks the question. And Adam says... Do you remember Adam's answer? Who, me? Moi? Yeah. <laughs> Adam says, the woman you gave me tempted me, and I ate from the fruit. So not only is it she is the one who did it, but you're the one who gave her to me, so you're to blame too. Okay, no, 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 no sense of contribution to this. Uh... No, no, or responsibility. responsibility. And of course, then God goes to Eve and says, "Is this right?" And Eve says, "Well, the snake tempted me." And again, you know, this is the uh, the garden that uh, God created, so it's somehow somebody. It's always somebody else's fault. So. Uh, the point of this is the fall has already happened. You don't need anything else. You've already left Eden. Yeah. And the reason uh, is because the story is designed to defend ourselves uh, against blame. And responsibility and blame are fundamentally different. The purpose of blame is simply to uh, create a scapegoat. Mm. Uh, back to biblical imagery, uh, to have somebody who is, whose fault it is so that we are off the hook. Mm. But truthfully, um, it's, uh, fault isn't helpful. Blaming isn't helpful in trying to solve a problem. Mm. What we have to do basically is to say, it's our problem. And until we do that, we aren't able to solve it. So, so if we take global warming... Uh, or whatever. Yes. Well, I was go I was going to say. Go ahead. Um, it's it's. I think it's um it's an experience a lot of mediators I can certainly re relate to. Um, when I hear accusations and blame uh, in in a mediation. Um, how to. How to intervene. Uh, in a way, that. Uh, invites the parties to reflect on their contribution, but um, I'm often I often pause before I say anything because I think, oh, I feel like I'm judging them now. I have a sense yes. that th th they're going to hear this as a judgment, so I can't. Pu and and then I've I missed the moment. <laughs> I mean, what, what? Well, this is actually the perfect moment. Go on. And the reason it's perfect is because there are two truths that you have realized. One, you're on to something, 
And two, this uh, is really dangerous and I could blow it here because I could lose them if I don't present this in a really skillful way. That's and it. that is the gateway to your improvement in, in terms of your skill mm -hmm. to find the way that is the uh, a way that will not lose them but will at the same time bring them face to face with the truth of this which is that there is something that they have contributed you can always ask a que the, this question but it is sometimes going to backfire yeah. um, and the question is uh, what have you contributed through action or inaction to this conflict mm. is there anything that you have contributed mm. but that isn't really going to necessarily do it and the person will feel blamed because they're blaming themselves yeah. it doesn't have to come from you it comes from inside of them mm. another uh, kind of milder form of that is if with 2020 hindsight what would you do differently but there's an actually a positive way of expressing it which is completely different and that is um, to uh, uh, instead of focusing on who caused it or you know, uh, uh, who started it or whose fault it is uh, to instead focus on what it would take to actually fix it completely and perfectly mm. and that is to shift into um, how you would like to resolve it. For example, um, what are the words that you would use to describe the kind of relationship that you would most like to have with each other? That doesn't sound like it's responsive to the blaming, mm. but I can tell you that if you ask that question, they'll shift out of blaming and they'll start thinking about positive words to describe what they want from the other person. And now there are two more interventions that you can make based on that. So first, uh, what are the words that you would use to describe your relationship, the kind of relationship you most want to have with the other person? Follow-up question um, to the other person. Do you disagree with any of those words? Hmm. No? Then we've reached consensus. Hmm. And what words would you use? And do you disagree with any of those words? No? Again, we have consensus. Okay. Now... Here's where it gets really, here's where the, 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 the rubber hits the road, as we say. Yeah. Um, uh, after you've reached that consensus, you can ask this question. Are you prepared, both of you, right now, to begin living up to those words in this conversation that we're going to have right now? And they will say yes. And then... Do any of us have permission to stop the conversation if it isn't working? Mm -hmm. And they will say, yes, great, let's start. Yeah. Yeah. And now you've left the blaming behind and you're really focusing on the positive elements that they want from each other. So, so you, you've, you've, you've done something or you've, you've said something a couple of times now which makes me think that there's you're referring to some kind of neuroscientific because you're talking about the, the example earlier about um, dropping out of anger into um, activating a different part of the brain that starts thinking more positive mm -hmm. thoughts, more compassionate, mm -hmm. generosity of spirit thoughts, you know. And the, and you've mentioned it again, you know, where you kind of you're 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 encouraging or inviting them to activate a different part of their their brain Did, have I got that right oh yes absolutely could you say a bit more uh, about about that sure uh, there's a chapter in the book <laughs> uh, called bringing oxytocin into the room the neurophysiology of conflict okay <clears throat> and it's a summary of maybe a hundred neurophysiology experiments um, and all of the things that we have learned so far, uh, there's a revolution, of course, taking place in neurophysiology. And um, the, it turns out that uh, there are various ways in which um, uh, the uh, emotions are processed inside the brain. Mm -hmm. 
the first thing to know is what happens when the emotional processing centers of the brain are completely shut down as a result of stroke, for example. Right. And the question is, what can't people do anymore? And the answer is, they can't make decisions. Even simple ones, like what kind of car to buy. Mm. Because that means, what kind of car do you like? And that's part of emotional processing. Every prioritization is using the emotional centers of the brain. Mm. But then it turns out that there are two circuits. There is the fight or flight reflex circuit, uh, which is mediated by the amygdala, um, which means almond, and it's a little uh, there are two little places in the brain right about here, little pods that stick out, and at the tip of those uh, are the amygdalae. And uh, those go directly to the adrenal glands, which pump out adrenaline and get you ready for fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And the second is the oxytocin circuit, um, which is uh, uh, a... Uh, there's a lot of research about it. it's described as the bonding chemical yeah. it increases trust um, but there are other elements of this as well it's, it's not just those elements there are ways of accessing um, the way that we process information in the brain probably the best book that's been written about this uh, two books actually one is by uh, Leonard Mladenow, uh called Subliminal and the other is by Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. And they're brilliant pieces of work about uh, priming uh, just the language that we use. So we know that people will negotiate more collaboratively, for example, if they're seated in soft chairs than if they're seated in hard chairs. If we use expressions like... Um, uh, we expect there will be a positive outcome, uh, that you're both going to uh, act more respectfully. If you use the word respectfully in your conversation, you are actually uh, neurophysiologically priming people to behave more respectfully towards each other. Really? Now, we don't, yes, this is, this is, th there are lots of experiments like this that show this. Yeah, or using the word rude. Uh, actually primes people to behave a little bit more rudely. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's probably uh, Ob Obama so, trying to get hold of you, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I wish. So, uh, that's about neurophysiology, and that's a chapter in the book for people who are interested. There's a lot that's being written about it now, and a lot of experiments that are taking place that are wonderful. Uh, Rebecca Sachs at Yale is doing brilliant work um, on dialogue and the neurophysiology of dialogue. Wow, fascinating! I mean, mm. uh, when you when you when you say soft chairs, you know, I, I I always say never underestimate the importance of thinking about your environment. Mm. And I, I did a mediation last year where it was in it was in a bank, and um, they they offered me a. a it's a typical sort of standard conferencing room, but it, did, it didn't have any windows and it was really formal. And I thought, yeah, I quite like. And they ended up giving me this client entertainment suite. They found another room in the <laughs> bank for me. And I'm not kidding you. They were just very low down, relaxed sofas, the lighting you could. Had a, and and the, both parties walked in and they looked at each other and looked at me and said, what's this? And, um, and I just said, hey, you know. I, th I think it'll it'll make the conversations, you know, flow better and and easier for you and, and create more of a relaxed, informal. And they went, okay, and and it was, you know, it was quite yeah. laid back and relaxed. So yeah, uh, never underestimate. But using the word respectfully, you know, so I'm coming back to language. Language is so important, Ken. You know how we can use language, the words that we use. Um, you know, to, to, to bring parties closer together. Uh, this, uh, I mean, it, it, this is just a, a minefield, not a minefield. Yeah. That's the wrong kind of metaphor, but it's, um, it can be a minefield, but also it can be a, 
a, a gold a, mine, a gold mine, or a <laughs> or a or a, an orchard of of um, mm, with, nice. with rich soil and lots yeah. of fruits <laughs> growing, and um, and, and we haven't and we haven't even touched on metaphor, but that's for another day, Ken, because I'm mm. I'm, I'm aware that time is moving on. You've been um, really really generous so far with your time. I've just got I've just got one question I wanted to close yeah. with. Um, I, I know you're incredibly passionate about developing this field, strengthening international collaboration, building bridges across disciplines, improving mediator effectiveness. What one, maybe two pieces of advice could you offer me and anyone watching this interview? What could we prioritize? What should we be prioritizing in order to kind of sh develop our thinking, to sharpen our, our, our skills, to hone our craft as a mm. mediator? Great question. Uh, let me think about this for a second. <laughs> I know you've uh, probably got a list of about 273 things. Right? <laughs> no, but the, the, the beauty is to try to boil it down to a couple of things. Uh, I would say the very first thing is uh, to recognize that uh, whatever level that you are at, uh, there is something that you can give to someone else who needs it desperately and who can use it. There's someone you can teach, and there's someone you can learn from. Uh, so uh, to, continue, uh, to consider yourself a lifelong learner uh, and to give everything away, everything that you have. Um, there's a wonderful, there was a wonderful interview with Jean Cocteau um, many years ago in which the interviewer said, um, uh, if there were a fire in your apartment, um, what would you save? And he said, why the fire, of course. <laughs> and so that's the second piece, okay. is to find the place of passion mm -hmm. inside of you, which I recognize in you, um, and to follow your passion. Ken Cloak, this has been a, a real privilege again. Um, Ken, if, if um, people want to find out more about the book, um, wh where's the best place for them to do that? Uh, they can do it at uh, Amazon, okay. of course, and also the publisher is Good Media uh, Press in Dallas, Texas. Okay, I imagine if they buy directly from you, they don't pay a, a huge commission to Amazon? No. Uh, uh, probably yes, but it's the shipping is gets to be complex if we're talking about going international. So okay. Amazon and, and England probably would be cheaper. Okay, all right, super. Okay. Well, um, Ken, um, I'm going to put all this information below the interview, and um, I know people are going to want to reach out just to say thank you. I know you're on Twitter, LinkedIn, and other forums, um, but I'm going to be the first one to say thank you, Ken Cloak. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan. It's been my pleasure. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you. Thanks, Ken.